Hey, good morning, folks. Welcome to this edition of Quarantine Collections. My name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the Educator and Collections Coordinator here at the Old Baldy Foundation. And on the phone this morning, we have our other collection staff member, McCallie Gibbons. Say hello, McCallie. Good morning. <laughs> McCallie is the brains behind the scenes here. I'm just, I guess, the pretty face that gets to tell the story. And McCallie is going to be uh, joining us this morning to help elaborate and shed light on a wonderful resource we have in telling the story of not just Old Baldy Lighthouse, but the other navigational aids on Baldhead Island and in the Lower Cape Fear region. And these are the official lighthouse reports that were commissioned by various bureaucratic boards, services, establishments charged with facilitating the uh, operations of the nation's lighthouses. And McCallie, you went through these um, a few weeks ago and kind of downloaded everything pertaining to Old Baldy, is that correct? Yeah, so there's a big gap because there's not really reports, but they go back to 1852 as the first report, um, but they pick back up in the 1870s and go until really the 1930s. So 60 something years. And where did you find these reports, uh, uh, McCallum? Uh, I, so different universities um, uh, uploaded their uh, reports on a digital library called, um, I'm probably gonna butcher the name, Hathis Trust, um, and so I was able to find their PDFs and search with it um, um, to find information about the Cape Fear region. Interesting. Okay. Well, folks, uh, there were kind of three different variations of the lighthouse service throughout history. From 1789, when the federal government assumes control for the nation's lighthouses or assumes responsibility for the nation's lighthouses, under President George Washington, the lighthouse establishment was very much uh, kind of, I call it a good old boys club. Like if you were a friend of the president, if you were a patron of the political party in charge, if you were a veteran, you were given a role within the lighthouse service or the lighthouse establishment. Uh, whether you were a keeper or somebody that was uh, supplying the lighthouses or providing the technology for the lighthouses. One example is Winslow Lewis, who has come up several times in these videos and will keep appearing in these videos. So it was kind of like, again, a good old boys club. If you were a patron of the political party, you got a job, you got a role in the lighthouse service, regardless if you had the qualifications, uh, if you had the knowledge or the skills to operate the nation's lighthouses successfully. And that's exactly why uh, the lighthouse establishment met its demise in the early 1850s. Uh, very clearly, the nation's lighthouses were not being managed well. They were very poorly uh, supplied with technology from folks like Winslow Lewis. And there was a push within Congress and within various stakeholders of the nation's uh, mariners to professionalize the lighthouse service. And that occurred in the early 1850s. In March of 1851, Congress commissioned an investigation of the nation's lighthouses. And that investigation turned up to be very thorough and very damning of the nation's lighthouses. They say they were uh, very, very poorly managed. So in January 30th, 1852, the report was delivered to Congress saying that y'all need to professionalize this branch of government service, which occurred on August 31st, 1852 by an act of Congress. They created a nine member board called the U.S. Lighthouse Board. And this board and its nine members were professionals Many of them were engineers from the Army and inspectors from the Navy. 
uh, and it operated throughout uh, the 19th century and into the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, it was President Taft that decided that rather than a board of nine members that were basically volunteers, we want to even further professionalize this service into the government civil service and create a paid role. Uh, we want to create official um, responsibilities, official employment opportunities within the bureaucracy of the federal government that will facilitate the nation's lighthouses. And that was called the Lighthouse Service. It was in uh, operation from about 1910 to 1939 under the Department of Commerce. And uh, in 1939 to today, the nation's lighthouses are in operation under the United States Coast Guard. That is the current uh, current uh, kind of uh, government uh, where they tuck it away. I have long story short. Um, if you're listening out there, give us a comment, give us a shout out. We have quite a few listeners this morning here. McCallie and I would love to hear from you. We have uh, Mackie. Good morning. Good morning, Mackie. Uh, I we'd rather you be here with us in person as well. We have Patty Henson. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Mimi. We miss you, Mimi. It's good to hear from you. So folks, if you're listening out there, give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know where you're listening from. Let us know your connection to Bald Head Island. And if you all have any questions for McCallie and I, uh, leave them there in the comments. Uh, we love to find an answer for you or elaborate, elaborate a little bit further. So, McCallie, um, how were the how was the lighthouse service? How did they manage to break up the different geographical regions of America? So originally, they divided the um, all the lighthouses and navigational aids into twelve districts, um, and um, Bald Head Island, Cape Fear region was put into district number six, and it remained in district number six um, pretty much through all the records that I went through. Um, as it got bigger and more navigational aids were added, they divided up the, re, um, the districts up to like about 18 different districts. So it did grow throughout the years. Um, so basically our district went from New River Inlet, North Carolina to um, Cape Canaveral in Florida. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, New River Inlet, uh, we want to elaborate because we've discussed um, new uh, inlets uh, very frequently the past few days. Now, New Inlet is a second inlet or access point from the Cape Fear River into the Atlantic Ocean. And this new inlet opened up as the result of a major hurricane in the year 1761. And that inlet was created by this hurricane north of Bald Head Island uh, along East Beach between Bald Head Island and what today is Curie Beach or Fort Fisher to our north. Throughout the late 1870s, 1880s, and into the early 1890s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers closed New Inlet by creating a man-made dam called the Swash Defense System. Uh, more colloquially known in these parts as the rocks, so New Inlet no longer exists. The New River Inlet that McCallie just discussed, that is the northern benchmark or the northern perimeter for the Six Lighthouse District, in which Old Baldy and Bald Head Island were a part of, that is in Jacksonville, North Carolina. The New River is the river that goes through Jacksonville and dumps out north of, you may be familiar if you're North Carolinian, of Bear Island or Hammocks Beach State Park, Swansboro, North Carolina. That is the northern perimeter of the Sixth Lighthouse District, not to be confused with New Inlet down here on Baldhead Island. 
Hey, good morning, Kara. It's good to hear from you. Uh, first thing Jace asked this morning when we got up is if there was time for a Travis video. Hey, well, we really like to hear that, uh, Kara and Jace. Uh, it's great to hear from you. We're hoping that y'all are healthy. Thanks for tuning in. Noni Williams. Hi, Travis. Back for another history lesson. Well, it's great to hear from you, Noni. Thank you for tuning in. Helen, happy Friday. We couldn't agree more. Happy Friday to you as well, Helen. And Donna, we love your presentations. We are from Long Island. Donna, hello from Bald Head Island. Thank you for tuning in from Long Island, New York. Folks, we have quite a few listeners. If you're joining us today, uh, give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know where you're listening from. And if we can clarify or answer any questions for you, give us another shout out there in the comments. Okay, well, thank you, McCallie, for kind of delineating the 6th District. I'm going to post here in the comments a picture of the map of the 6th District for us. Computer is not working the best right now, but I promise in a few minutes I will post a picture of that. Um, maybe it'll work this way. You gotta love technology, right? So the map that Travis is gonna post, um, it shows the entire district, and then it has some cutouts to show um, to go a little bit more into detail of, with a few of the other rivers in the district. So you'll see the Savannah River. And you'll also see Cape Fear. So you'll see all those navigational aids that were used along the Cape Fear River, um, all the navigational aids around Baldhead Island. What you won't see in the close-up probably is Frying Pan Shoals, um, the vessel out there. And that's just because it's so it's such a big close-up. But in the bigger uh, picture, you will see Frying Pan Shoals out there. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, McCallie, for pointing that out. Um, just trying to get this picture in there, but it does not want to go. So when I have a little more access and not juggling so many things, we will post that picture for you all. Okay, so the first Lighthouse Report, um, we're talking just about Old Baldy today. We're going to revisit uh, these reports in later episodes and discuss other lighthouses in Baldhead Island and the surrounding waterways that appear in these reports. But today we're just going to discuss uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse. And the first report we wanted to bring up was the year 1852, as McCallie said, is the first uh, year uh, that they commissioned a report. And it says about Old Baldy that there were 15 lamps of 21 inch reflectors. And it says that this lamp was inadequate to the requirements of the service of an ordinary seacoast light. While this is one of these special cases requiring extraordinary means to ensure any amount of good. The tower, that is Old Baldy, is nearly four miles from the pitch of the Cape, that is Cape Feeder, and 20 nautical miles from the direct line on the end of Frying Pan Shoals which extend continuously from the pitch of the Cape. The assumed elevation of the light is 110 feet, which with good illuminating apparatus would give a range under the most favorable circumstances of 17 to 17 and a half nautical miles. Careful observation has however shown that it is very seldom to be seen 12 miles offshore and then only resembling a star of the fifth or the sixth magnitude. This light is considered by the pilots of very little, if indeed no use at all, for the local purposes of the harbor, while it is perfectly clear that it is of no value to the navigator in guiding him around and clear of these shoals, which in the opinion of navigators is only exceeded in the importance of those shoals off of Nantucket. The light should either be reduced to a mere harbor light or removed to the pitch of the cape and given, and given an elevation sufficient to ensure a first order light being seen under ordinary circumstances outside of the shoals. Wow, McCallie, that's not a very good report card, is it? Um, no, and I mean, we talked about this and we mentioned it kind of everywhere is Old Baldy was built pretty far off. It was built pretty far off the water. Um, 
we talked about, I know um, on our tours we've mentioned it, and then the museum, we, it was built pretty far off the water. However, it wasn't built close enough to Frying Pan Shoals to help out on the seacoast. Um, so they do recommend maybe moving it down to a harbor light um, along and help along the river more. And McCallie, can you define what's the difference between a harbor light and a seacoast light? Because they're using those terms pretty frequently here in the 1852 report. Yeah, so a harbor light is a light to guide ships safely into the harbor. Um, this is usually a small light at the end of a pier. Uh, it's not always a lighthouse, but it's more of a welcoming light. Um, a seacoast light is to warn mariners of something out at the sea. So the shoals along frying pan shoals and along the Cape Fear. So it's a lot what you what Cape Fear Light Station was built for. Um, and we'll probably talk about in a later episode, the development of Cape Fear Light Station. But that was the whole point of it was to be a seacoast light to warn mariners. Okay, fascinating. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Unfortunately, I mean, I think McCallie might hurt Old Baldy's feelings uh, by bringing this all up, but she wasn't very good at her job, was she? No, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> so uh, we're going to fast forward. Of course, 1852 is just a few years before the American Civil War breaks out, about nine years before the American Civil War breaks out. And we have it discussed in detail, in a future episode we will, the Confederates or the Southerners, they take apart Old Baldy's Lantern and all other lighthouses up and down the North Carolina coastline and in other states that eventually formed this Southern Confederacy. They didn't want the Union Navy to have the opportunity to use these lighthouses to capture Southern ports that were essential to importing war materials to fight the North or Union successfully. So for a time period in the beginning of the Civil War, Old Bodhi was dismantled. Now eventually for the Confederates do replace a light on top of Old Baldy. was not as bright, was not as large as her pre-war light, but uh, they did relight her in order to guide blockade runners into the port of Wilmington. And then when Bald Head Island is captured in January of 1865 by the Union Army and Union Navy. Uh, she was again extinguished. And it wasn't until 1880 that Old Baldy was relit. And it had everything to do with, again, New Inlet. New Inlet had its own lighthouse. It was called Federal Point Lighthouse. That lighthouse was in operation for about 15 years, from 1865 to 1880, while Old Baldy was decommissioned. She was not being used. It was preferred that you went into the port of Wilmington from New Inlet, just north of Wilmington, using Federal Point Lighthouse. Thus, there was no role for Old Baldy. Well, when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the late 1870s, throughout the 1880s, was working on closing up New Inlet with that man-made dam, Old Baldy once again had a role here in the Lower Cape Fear. So they reestablished Old Baldy in the year 1880, and the 1883 and 1884 Lighthouse Reports has some very interesting clues for historians like McCatley and I, and listeners like you. First of all, the 1883 report, it says a new lens was put into the lantern and the light was changed from a flashing white to a flashing red with intervals of 30 seconds. A house was provided for the keeper. Three small private houses on the lighthouse grounds were removed. And then the 1884 report says, in August, the Lighthouse Board authorized the construction of a stone jetty 150 feet long for the protection of the foundation of the tower. This work was completed in time to probably save the tower from destruction in the September hurricane of 1883. The tower is now comparatively safe but it is thought that an extension of the jetty for 50 feet will result in the gain of land that extends and makes the tower secure. The keeper's dwelling requires various repairs 
and 400 linear feet of picket fence are needed to enclose the grounds. It is estimated that the extension of the jetty and the necessary repairs of the dwelling and the fence will cost about $1,500. Wow, McCallie, a lot to unpack there. Um, first of yes. all, uh, the house provided for the keeper. Which keeper's cottage are we talking about there? We're talking about the second keeper's cottage that was built on the grounds, which is what um, the one looks like today. Okay, so the reproduction keeper's cottage that I'm in right now is based on that cottage they're talking about in the 1883 report? Yes, and they'll mention in another report, I don't know if it's before or after the 1883, that they also do some repairs along the kitchen, which is not open for exhibit at the lighthouse. It's used for staffing, uh, for staffing needs, but they do talk about the kitchen and it being repaired as well. Interesting. Okay. And the three private houses on the lighthouse grounds, McKelly and I, you know, we've kind of talked about this where it's always a question. Kevin uh, Duffus, I'm sure, our, uh, the author wrote our uh, new book. You know, I'm sure he has some thoughts. Uh, my interpretation is that they are either dwellings constructed by the Confederates. Remember 1883? That's that's 20 years before Confederates arrive here on the island during the Civil War and have an encampment. And if you watched our video at Battery Number 4, uh, there's a primary source uh, from a captain that served here, Charles Banson, and he's writing that the dwellings the Confederates built uh, in their encampment here on Baldhead Island were by no means tiny little cottages. They were substantial buildings with chimneys and cedar-shaped roofs and beds and china. So these are not tents the Confederates are living in. These are, these are homes. Um, so it's my thought that if they're not homes left over from the Civil War, they're homes built by river pilots on Bald Head Island to provide some protection while they're out here looking for ships on the horizon to guide into the Cape Fear River. Or perhaps they're a mixture of both. They're buildings built by the Confederates that were later repurposed by the river pilots for shelter while staying here on Bald Head Island. Uh, this jetty, uh, McCauley, that has an important role in the history of Bald Head Island, right? Yeah, it does. And you know a little bit more about the jetty, and you've done a video talking about the jetty a little bit. Um, right. So, so um, the jetty is the land that the current marina is on. That spit of land, that 10 acres of land out there on the, uh, on the marina is man-made. So when they closed up New Inlet, it began filtering even more water pressure down the Cape Fear River to the mouth of the river known as Old Inlet between Baldhead Island and Oak Island, where the Oak Island Lighthouse is today. And that started to chip away or to erode land here around the Lighthouse Reservation. So in order to stop or prevent that erosion due to the hydraulics of the river, they created this stone jetty that started accumulating sand that eventually became that neck of land the current marina sits on. And I encourage you to look at our video previously that talks about the story of the marina and how the permitting process was approved to build that marina specifically because it was put on that land that was man-made. The uh, permits were not approved when they were trying to build the marina on the natural part of the island in the saltwater marsh and attempting to use the pier off of Old Baldy Lighthouse. So interesting. And uh, McCallie, she knows that well, the picket fence, if you visited Old Baldy, we have a picket fence around us, and uh, seems like it's pretty historically accurate to me, right? Definitely. <laughs> now, I wonder, did our fence cost $1,500 to fix after Hurricane Florence? That's the big question. That is. <laughs> so we're going to skip ahead to the 1890 Lighthouse Report. We've got a few minutes left here. 
going to read here, a new system of lights for crossing the bar and entering the Cape Fear River went into operation on July 15th, 1889. This consisted in establishing the new channel range, front and rear post lights, and the moving of the westward of Oak Island Range front beacon so that the intersection of this range with that of the new channel is indicated by a bell buoy paced in, placed in the entrance of the Cape Fear River. The new channel range leads through a dredged channel across the bar. And then here's the important point. The Smith Island range lights carry through bald head channel. And then by using the front post light of the new channel range and on Cape Fear light as the rear range, a vessel is carried to safe anchorage off of South. McCallie, can you elaborate what is a range light? So normally it's two lights associated to form a range. Um, the front light or the lower light um, is near to the mariner using the range. The rear range light um, and the one that's normally further back um, from the mariner. You kind of do have some, you have some lights to show people how to do it. Yeah. Um, so you have um, the lights are aligned. And so it's helping for navigational purposes. Right. So if you're not correctly positioned, you're going to see two lights. That's correct? Yes. And so you want to be in sync with everybody. And they have these range lights going up and down the Cape Fear River, um, at least at 1.16 of them. 16. Uh. You got it. Wow. So... So basically, McCallie, they're using, they're arranging a front light on the beach and they're putting that directly in front of Old Baldy and when they're lined up, they're in the correct angle to enter the Cape Fear River and not crash aground? Yeah, so in the report, it also talks about, um, it's really Old Baldy's um, only use is that it's a rear beacon or rear range light to stake light, um, forming a range to guide up the river after the crossing of that bar. So you're right. They're basically using Old Baldy as a range light. So Old and not as much as a harbor light. So Old Baldy is not even a lighthouse anymore, right? Really, no. So you're telling me <laughs> Old Baldy was not even a lighthouse technically throughout much of her history? Yeah, I mean, it was disconnected for a while. I mean, it does use as a harbor light, um, and it, it really is used as a range light for a while, and it really has to do with the positioning of where it was located on the island. It couldn't help um, frying pan shoals. It couldn't couldn't help the seacoast, so they were like, let's try to help the river as much as we can. So by turning it into almost a range light, um, that's the way they were able to still use it. That's fascinating. I think you've broken some hearts out there, McCallie. I probably did. <laughs> Old Baldy and I are going to need a bottle of wine tonight to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, that's you, you've heard it right, folks. Now, you know, we're being a little facetious. We kind of understood this, but I, I, something that we really wanted to get across to you all listening out there is, again, as McCallie just said, Technically, Old Baldy is not a lighthouse throughout the later part of her history. She is a range light. And McCallie, where can folks find an example of range lights today? Um, you're going to know that answer better than I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest. Isn't there one when you leave the ferry, right? Well, you see Price's Creek, there is still one range light there. I thought you were talking about a set of range lights. No. Um, yes, Price's Creek, when you're leaving out Deep Point Marina, um, was a range light that was used around here. Um, it doesn't have the second one, so you're not going to see a set of them. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so when you're coming out of the ferry, um, out, coming out of Deep Point, heading towards Old Baldy Lighthouse, if you look to your left, just as you're coming out of the marina, you'll be able to see a small brick range light called Price's Creek range light. If you're coming back from Baldhead Island into Southport, 
just as you're making that left hand turn to get into Deep Point Marina, the very end of your ferry ride, you can look to your right and see that range light. You can see it much better on the Fort Fisher Southport Ferry, uh, but of course, it has not been in operation for a long time. So, all right, the last uh, report McCallie and I want to discuss was the year 1903. So, nearing the end of Old Baldy's tenure, it says, a day to the last report, it became evident that the con... Oh, oh, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong lighthouse. It says, <laughs> Upon establishment of the new Cape Fear light, the old Cape Fear station will be changed from a fourth order flashing light with intervals of 30 seconds to a fourth order fixed light, and its name will be changed to Bald Head Light Station. So that name between Cape Fear and Bald Head must have been confusing for you when looking at these reports, right, McCallie? So, yeah, so they don't really call, they never call Old Baldy Old Baldy. Um, and they do reference it as Bald Head from time to time in parentheses. But in the beginning years, they're really referring it as Cape Fear. And when the talk of building Cape Fear Light Station, um, they started referring to Cape Fear Light Station as a seacoast light, and they do that in this report, and they refer to Old Baldy as Cape Fear Light a lot of times, um, or Cape Fear on Bald Head at the entrance, or they would use the words like entrance of the Cape Fear River. Um, so descriptive aids, but they would still call it Cape Fear. Interesting, yeah, so... So, folks, it's not until Cape Fear Light Station is completed in the year 1903, out where the Conservancy is today, that what we know as Old Baldy today becomes known as Bald Head Light. Uh, remember, Bald Head is the western part of this island along the river. Cape Fear is the eastern part of the island out towards Captain Charlie's of the Conservancy uh, or the Shoals Club. So lots of different names, and this came up in a video or a few days ago when we were discussing the history of Old Baldy. It's like three different names, they all are interchangeable, they're all synonymous, and their meanings adapt and morph depending on which year you are discussing. It's just like the history of this island. Is it Smith Island? Is it Cedar Island? Is it Cape Island? Is it Baldhead Island? Is it Palmetto Island? Well, it, it's all the above. Um, so it certainly doesn't make interpretation uh, any easier. But lucky, luckily, we got some smart cookies like McCallie that can help uh, walk folks through this. Um, so McCallie, is there anything that we kind of missed in these reports that you would like to discuss? talked about the major um major changes that happened to bald head um and it does think that it they do say it's not as not not as needed the lighthouse is not they use the word useless at one point which is almost it's just sad because we love old baldy so much um but you know i think that's really a good overview of these reports and this is where we really get all that main information to talk about old baldy is from these reports if we didn't have these reports we wouldn't really know the changes in the lights from flashing to white to red any of that um that's where we really found a lot of that good information from okay well, well great um well thank you so much mccallie for joining us today and Thank you to all of you for joining us. We're gonna post a map of the 6th Lighthouse District uh, here once we uh, tune off for today. If you have any questions, if you're listening in the future or you'd like us to elaborate on something, just give us a shout out in those comments and we'd love to hear from you and we will get back to you. April 8th is approaching fast. It is next Wednesday or this coming Wednesday. We're gonna have a virtual historic happy hour discussing the history and memory of the old boathouse that this island lost during Hurricane Florence in 2018. It is going to be uh, a little more interactive, meaning that you will have an opportunity to be on camera as well. So 
not just looking at my ugly face, we'll get to see all your beautiful faces and you'll get to show us what libation of choice you are drinking. I am most certain I will be having some scotch or bourbon to get me through the history. You can find information about that historic happy hour on our website, oldbaldy.org. And when you visit our website, you can find our online newsletter that we send out just once a month. In that newsletter, there is a code. It is called um, Virtual Historic Happy, I think, something like that. Find it on our newsletter. It entices you to sign up on our newsletter. And you can sign up for that Historic Happy Hour free by using that code. And if you'd like to make a donation, uh, those tickets are $15 when we host them here at the Lighthouse. We would very much appreciate your generosity and your support during these trying times. When you're on our website, we also have a brand new online store with all kinds of apparel, books, puzzles, gifts, you name it, it's up there. Modern Clay Works by Melissa Reddick, some beautiful pieces of pottery that feature uh, very um, um, unique images from our collections, including images of that Keeper's Cottage that McCallie and I were discussing in these reports. You're not gonna find these images anywhere else, folks, and they make beautiful gifts. So uh, Easter is approaching and some other holidays. So uh, might uh, go on our website and check it out. You're supporting a great cause by supporting and shopping in that online store. This afternoon, we have a, another guest, another great program for you. We're going to be interviewing Jane Oakley and doing a live oral history. Jane Oakley is a former executive director of the Old Baldy Foundation. Her tenure was during the construction of the current Keeper's Cottage that I'm in. This reproduction Keeper's Cottage that was built in the year 2000 as a model of that second Keeper's Cottage that McCallie and I discussed today that is also in Melissa Reddick's Pottery. So uh, that is going to be a fruitful and fascinating uh, interview that will step back into time and learn how the Old Baldy Foundation grew at the turn of the 21st century. So we'd love to have you this afternoon at two o'clock. If you can't join us live or you'd like to see a previous video, you will find them on our Facebook Live. You will find them on Instagram TV. And you will also find them on our YouTube channel. When you visit our YouTube channel, hit subscribe for us. Help us increase our social media presence. So about the entire Old Baldy Foundation and directors, we sincerely hope that you, your family is healthy, that you are safe, we are, are proud to provide this little bit of levity, this little bit of educational time during these very difficult times. It's scary, it's frightening what's happening out there. And we thank uh, all our essential employees, all our medical personnel. Uh, my mom works at a hospital. Um, we thank you all out there um, for continuing to do what you are, uh, what your role is to help stem this epidemic, to uh, make sure that more families out there are safe and that they're healthy and that our nation can get through this and uh, hopefully very soon get back to normal uh, with um, as little death and as little trouble um, as is necessary. So thank you for tuning in and we'll see you at a later episode, everybody. Thanks for joining us.